Thank you, Rosaire. Okay, let's read together Psalm 100. A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for each person here, that our hearts and minds will be open to worship you in spirit and truth, and that we'll set aside all the anxieties and thoughts other than focusing on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you please rise and join us in worship?
to get too excited about that, right? That's right. <laughs>
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. I love I'll Fly Away. That's one of my favorite hymns. It's going to be sung at my funeral, so I just, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting anxious already, ready to go home. Our Old Testament scripture comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 19. After they set out from, from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession." Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer to the Lord. And our New Testament comes from the book of Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to celebrate this Father's Day, we just uh, come before you as our Heavenly Father. You are the perfect Father, and sometimes our relationships with our own earthly fathers have not been as nice as we would like, but uh, we know that our Heavenly Father always knows what's best for us, even though we don't always understand your ways or your thoughts. Too many times we've sought your hands and not your face for what you could give us rather than a relationship with you. We ask for your forgiveness and your love for us that was so great that you would send your own son as a sin offering for us, that we could be reconciled back to you through his shed blood and rose again. Lord, we thank you for how much you've blessed us. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our church family and how much they mean to us. Lord, as we go out and into the world, we pray that uh, we will be your light and your salt to those around us, and that we'll be able to not only love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but to love our neighbors as, as you have loved us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I do remember sitting in the back seat feeling like the car was so big and so strong and having my dad and mom in the front. And I remember with my brother having to hold on, hold on tight when my dad would go around corners. My dad bought a 1965 Chevy Impala SS Super Sport with everything he had. I think he cherished the car, not just because he was the first owner and he drove it off the lot, but it was more than a car to him. It really was his baby. He had the car for 20 years until the mid 80s. My parents had to sell the car because times were tough and they had to make ends meet. It was not easy for my dad to let the car go. A few years ago, it it just kind of dawned on me that if I could somehow miraculously find the car, that it, it, it would be worth the search. Does the car still even exist? Is it in a junkyard somewhere? But when I put in the VIN number and paid for the online search, it actually told me what address it had been registered in in a different state. We heard nothing back from the owner, no response. We sent two letters with no response. After Arizona, it went to Pennsylvania. It was in New York. I was two steps behind the car on, on each of my searches. The possibility of finding the car was renewed when the owner in Maine got back to us. But then he said, you just missed the car. A group of Canadians came down, loaded it on a flatbed, and drove it to Canada. At that moment, I figured the car was gone forever. 1965 Chevy Impala. I told my wife, my brother and I decided that we're going to pay the private investigator. She gave me a look, basically, you guys are crazy. And she said, why don't you just do one more of your general online searches? And it was about 11 o'clock at night. And I sat down, and I typed in the words. And the first hit said, 1965 Chevy Impala SS 396 for sale, Montreal, Quebec. My heart dropped. I called the dealer, confirmed the VIN number that it was the actual car, and bought it over the phone. Gotta give her gas. OK, that sounds so good. I'm, I actually may be keeping this for myself. It's just amazing that it's almost 30 years that I used to sit back here. It's incredible. It's like a time machine. So now that we have the car, we've been planning to give it to my dad as a surprise. He has no idea that we've searched for it, and it's going to be the surprise of his life, I think. He will see the car, and he will just say, that's my Chevy. I know he will. Mommy, what? I'm watching, guys. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good job. Whoa. <laughs> All right, Kate, can you do that? That one? Yeah. yeah let really me, I'll low. catch you. Come really low. OK. I got you. Oh, yeah. oh no. What the oh. hell? Dear God. That's my old Chevy. We got it, Pop. You're kidding me. Really? Yeah. Here, come on. Really? Oh, no. Yeah. I knew you got that. God, I'm going to have a heart attack. We found it. We found it. I can't talk. I don't, it's okay. It took five years. Really? Hear me? It's all good, Dad. We found it. Wow. Oh, I, I'm just stunned. Look at the back of the light. I, I just don't even know what to say. And it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Automatic. Well, they changed the muffler. <laughs> wow. Wow, gee, I can't even believe this is for real. <laughs> it's not just a car. It's all the memories and the feelings. It brings all that back.
leaving home. What's up, bro? Man, welcome home. You let him drive this? Oh, he's a good driver. So, uh, Dad was, you know, he wanted to be here. It's all right. It's fine. He's really happy, but uh, he's just... I know. His dad. Come on. Congratulations, Mike. He's so big already. I wish I could have been there. Hey. We're so proud of you. What's up, Buzz? You're cleaning up already? Party just started. I don't like things to get backed, backed up. up. Your father will be back soon. He's running an errand for me. What is it that you needed? <sighs> Kyle, he's so excited about you coming home. I know. I'm just wondering what he'll say he was going out for this time. Well, why don't you ask him yourself? Actually, right on time. Welcome home, son. Thanks, Dad. Your mother always needing something. Yeah, Dad. So, how's she running? Still remember the day I got her? Heck, every guy in my squad came back from the war looking to get one of these. When I was over there, just the thought of it kept my mind off of things, you know? I know how it could be. And coming home, that's... Yeah. I ever tell you I picked your mother up for our first date in this car? Did I ever tell you I took Sarah Thompson out for our first date in this car? You did no such thing. Gave Mark 20 bucks not to tell you. I checked the mileage. Every day, I know. That's why we just went three houses down. We just parked and listened to music. I didn't tell Sarah that was why, but I knew you'd be checking, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you say? Wanna go for a real drive, a little farther this time? You're finally gonna let me drive your car? <laughs> not mine. Yours. You're kidding. Almost as pretty as mine. It's beautiful. I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything, son. I'm just glad you're home. Yeah, Dad. Me too. Heavenly Father, earthly fathers with texts throughout scripture, what we have is a synopsis of every passage on fathers in scripture. Oh, Rev, I've boiled 96 pages down to nine of research. First of all, to the dads, happy Father's Day. I trust that as you grill 
non-meatless, non-meatless meat that you have a very special day. The clips for our introduction show a father's love and also a son's, two sons' love for their dads. There actually, as we come to scripture, interesting insights into this. There are many, many names for father that are used and also in our parlance that we speak in English language. Dad, dada, daddy, papa, pappy, pop, papa. Papa in its variations and all of its different nuances are often the first utterances that children use with the P and the B and the D sounds. It's what child language acquisition experts call reduplicated canonical babbling. They have to label everything, don't they? <laughs> Father was originally spelled with a D, not with a TH until the late 1500s, so it was Fada, F-A-D-D-E-R. Dad was first used in the 1500s. Pop, not a soda, Pop is the most recent addition in our country from back in the 1830s. I'm not sure how you refer to your dad. Hopefully, like me, you realize he's the old man. Ah, don't say that. But fathers. The late newscaster, Paul Harvey, whom I enjoyed listening to twice a day when he was alive, wrote this eloquent piece on fathers, and I quote, a father is a thing that's forced to endure, endure childbirth without an anesthetic. <laughs> a father is a thing that growls when it feels good and laughs loud when it's scared half to death. A father never feels entirely worthy of worship in his child's eyes. He never is quite the hero his daughter thinks, never quite the man his son believes him to be. This worries him sometimes, so he works too hard to try and smooth out the rough places in the road for those of his own who will follow after him. A father is a thing that gets very angry when school grades aren't as good as he thinks they should be. He scolds his son, though he knows it's the teacher's fault. <laughs> Fathers grow old faster than other people. And while mothers can cry when it shows, fathers stand there beaming outside, dying inside. They have fathers' very stout hearts. And so they have to be broken sometimes, or otherwise no one would know what's inside. <laughs> Fathers give daughters away to other men who aren't nearly good enough so they can have grandchildren who are, the sm are smarter than anybody's. <laughs> Fathers fight dragons almost daily. They hurry away from the breakfast table, off to the arena, which is sometimes called an office or workshop, where they tackle the dragons with three heads, weariness, work, and monotony. Fathers are knights in shining armor. Fathers make bets with insurance companies about who will live the longest. Though they know the odds, they keep right on betting. Even as the odds get higher and higher, they keep right on betting more and more. And one day, they lose. But fathers enjoy an earthly immortality and the bets paid off to the part of him that he leaves behind. Ann Landers had a newspaper column which took an article originally in a Danish, or actually Dutch magazine, it read as follows. When I was four years old, my daddy can do anything. When I was five years old, my daddy knows a whole lot. When I was six years old, my daddy is smarter than your dad. When I was eight years old, my dad doesn't exactly know everything. When I was 10 years old, in the olden days when dad grew up, things were so different. When I was 12 years old, oh well, naturally dad doesn't know anything about that. He's old, three, too old to remember his childhood. 
When I was 14 years old, don't pay attention to my dad. He's, he's so old-fashioned. When I was 20 years old, dad? He's hopelessly out of date. When I was 24 year, 25 years old, dad knows about it, but then he should. He's been around so long. <laughs> when I was 30 years old, maybe we should ask dad what he thinks. After all, he's had a lot of experience. When I was 35 years old, I'm not doing a single thing until I talk to dad. When I was 40 years old, I wonder how dad would have handled this. He was so wise. When I was 50 years old, I'd give anything if my dad were here. so I could talk this over with him. Too bad I didn't appreciate how smart he was. I could have learned a lot from him. This evening, if it's not raining, I'll be in my childhood rowboat, which my dad let me use and I refinished three years ago and finished on Father's Day on the Montpelier Reservoir thinking about dad. Father's Day. I'm not going to be giving all the scriptures today. They won't be on the screen. I won't have you turning pages. I want you to just listen to this summary, this synopsis of what God says about our dads or to you and me who may be a dad. And if you want the text for your own research and for using later on, I'll give you a hard copy or you can send an email. I'll send it to you electronically. Let's start with types of fathers as found in God's word. Biological fathers, those having sons and daughters who are physically their offspring. Check. Adoptive fathers, men having sons or daughters, not physically theirs, but who legally and, legally and financially are theirs. Scripture recalls that after Esther, Hadassah lost her parents, that Mordecai took her as his daughter. Spiritually, God is referred to as an adoptive father of each Christian believer. So wrote St. Paul in his Roman epistle, quote, We've received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Actually, the term daddy, intimate. They're surrogate fathers, men caring for individuals who are not biologically nor legally theirs, but they provide care and assistance as if they were their own children. Job declared, quote, I was a father to the needy. And he referred to an individual nearby, quote, from my youth he grew up with me as with my father. There are derelict, irresponsible, absentee fathers, men who have sons or daughters who were physically or legally theirs, but for whom they've provided no care, no assistance. They were absentee, as the psalmist wrote in chapter 27, verse 10, my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Occupational fathers, men relating to others in the realm of their employment in a father-like role. Servants sometimes refer to their employers, their masters as father. Joseph observed during his captivity and enslavement in Egypt, quote, God made me like a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his household, ruler over the land of Egypt. There are gifted fathers in scripture, extraordinary men in military service, one father described as an expert in warfare, a mighty, valiant man. Musically talented fathers, fathers who played the lyre, played the harp, played the pipe, fathers under whose direction sons would sing or play cymbals, clash, harps, lyres in the house of the Lord. Fathers who taught their young people to use musical gifts to honor the Lord. Political, national fathers whose descendants eventually, numerous as they were, comprised tribes, even nations. Father Abraham, his name was Abram, but Abraham, father of many, the term that God, name that God gave to him. 
And there are spiritual fathers, spiritual mentors, men who were exemplars of faith, who either introduced others to a saving knowledge of the Lord or who spiritually mentored them thereafter. Some positive examples, Abraham, Father Abraham, we're told in scripture, dubbed the father of all who believe. Or a Levite of whom Micah made this request, be a father and a priest to me. Others who spoke of their spiritual mentors as father, political leaders who addressed their spiritual mentors as father, my father. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, St. Paul expressed this, in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. He had the honor of seeing men and women come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He was their spiritual father. Conversely, in scripture, there is one negative example of a father, a spiritual father. John's gospel says of Satan, you're of your father, the devil, You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks a lie from his own nature. He's a liar, the father of lies. And although I could cover many comments of this, the next slide that is not there, this is the one beyond, it should be in your notes, relationships with our fathers. So see where it says relationships with fathers on the screen? You see that, correct? Uh Uh-huh. There's an honor code at Norwich. You're lying. (laughs) So we're dealing with relationships with fathers. In 10 biblical texts, we're enjoined to honor our fathers and our mothers. It's the fifth of God's 10 commandments. In Leviticus, through Moses, the Lord declares we're expected to revere to respect our fathers and mothers. In the first pastoral letter through St. Paul, God urges us to appeal to our fathers, not to sharply rebuke them. We appeal to our dads. We don't sharply rebuke our dads. And assuming that what fathers ask of us is biblically ethically and morally correct, the scriptures expect that the appropriate response to our Father's directives will be full and complete obedience. The children of Jonadab affirm this, we obeyed the voice of our Father in all that he commanded us. Jesus spoke glowingly of sons who did their Father's will. The Apostle Paul expressed that a child was to serve his father. Jesus declared regarding himself, I have kept my father's commandments. And sadly, in spitefulness, several Old Testament books chronicle how some young men manifested disobedience to their dads by deliberately and wantonly marrying women against their father's advice, ungodly women who later on took their husbands away from the Lord. Ezekiel lamented how some individuals disrespected and disregarded their fathers and mothers. He writes, treating them lightly. Interesting term in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew verb bears the nuances of slighting them, regarding them in a swift or trivializing manner, evidencing superficiality, contempt, cursing, even despising. Attentiveness to a father's directives was expected. The Bible says, listen, hear the instruction of a father. Give attention so you will gain understanding. Consult Quote, consider the years of all generations. Ask your father. He will inform you. And offspring were warned against physical and verbal abusiveness towards their fathers and their mothers. From Exodus and Proverbs and Leviticus, he who assaults his father is a shameful and disgraceful son. He who curses his father 
in the darkness his lamp will go out. And so sons or daughters can be a heartbreak or a blessing to their dads, evoking either gladness and joy or sadness and grief. Several writers in the book of Proverbs state this, let your father and mother be glad. A wise son makes a father glad. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise son will be glad in him. But those same authors in Proverbs lament that a father of a fool has no joy. A foolish son is a destruction and a grief to his father. As an aside, I trust that on this particular Father's Day in 2017 that you and I are occasions for paternal joy, that our fathers, if they're still living, find joy in you. I pray that on this Father's Day, those of us who are fathers, who have children that are estranged from us or far away, that in in time, by God's grace, see them come back and come home. I remind my fellow dads of Jesus' parable in Luke 15, where there was a prodigal son who squandered all that his father had given to him, who eventually came home and was warmly embraced by his father, who actually ran to his son. He never stopped watching. He'd always been waiting and praying for that son to return. The late Keith Green, whose music I still think is unmatched by many other musicians, who ministered through song, did not entertain. He wrote his marvelous prodigal son sweet before he came to a saving knowledge of Christ the Savior. Did you know that? I read that in the book that his widow, Melody, wrote called No Compromise. Even before he walked with the Lord, Keith was searching for the Lord, and he wrote that marvelous sweet. If you haven't heard it, go on YouTube and type in prodigal son sweet. It's lengthy but it's phenomenal. It's also a video attached to it where you can watch on the screen the story. If we consider, going back one, the attitudes of fathers, I could name a number, but a few stand out such as these. Positively, a father's kindness. Of our Heavenly Father, Paul writes in Romans, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance, O Lord. It's your kindness. Negatively, in attitudes, the Bible records a father's unfriendliness. A father's inappropriate anger and vengeance as King Saul against David. A father who made his workers yoke their burden unnecessarily hard. Bad attitudes. So biblically, let's move on to the legacy of some fathers in scripture. And I'll start negatively. Now, you know, photographers always start with negatives and make positives at the end, the prince. So bear with me on this. Negatively, there are some deplorable legacies that were left behind by fathers. Standards for their children to repudiate, not emulate. One, practicing favoritism. Practicing favoritism. Preferential treatment of one offspring over others. Jacob, his favoritism toward his son Joseph, evoked jealousy and hatred from Joseph's siblings. The text says, quote, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. It was dad's fault. Or Shimri, although he was not the firstborn, we're told in First Chronicles, his father made him first. May I tell you that St. Peter makes it clear that that's not God's practice with regard to any one of us. In his first letter, the apostle pens this observation, quote, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves with reverence in the time you have upon earth. We address as Father he who impartially 
judges each one of us. He's fair. Negatively, besides practicing favoritism, some legacies left behind, fathers following after other gods, all forms of idolatry. You know that anything placed before the Lord becomes a god, small g. Someone, something, some goal, some project, money, whatever. Fathers whose legacy was putting other things, serving other gods first. Fathers not being wholly devoted to the Lord, which means partially devoted, restrictively devoted, selectively committed to the Lord. I'll follow you, Lord, but. Not my answer is yes, Lord, what's your question? I've already determined you're Lord. It's not for me to determine yes or no. What's the marching order? What's the command, sir? My answer is yes, what's your question? Legacies that we did not want to see but were left behind. Fathers not being humble before the Lord. Fathers being unfaithful to the Lord. Fathers sinning, transgressing, acting treacherously against the Lord, forsaking, forgetting the Lord, not walking in the way of the Lord. Fathers provoking God to anger, provoking God to wrath. Fathers who would test and try God's patience. Fathers not listening to, but rather stiffening against disbelieving, disobeying, or rebelling against God's commands. Fathers doing what was evil and wicked in God's sight, acting abominably, committing unmitigated sin and iniquity, engaging in sexual indiscretions, practicing extortion or theft. That's the legacy of some fathers in Scripture. Positively, ah, positively is better. We like that, right? Here a standard for children to emulate. I remind you that often a father's name was passed on to his children, used in naming towns as well. In my family, my grandfather was Bill, my father was Bill, my uncle was Bill. I'm Bill. My uncle was Bob, my brother is Bobby, my cousin is Rob, our son, Christopher. (laughs) Positively, a legacy left behind, being men of God, of whom this was said, the God of my fathers, my father is God, the God before whom my father walked, the God of our fathers, the God of your fathers, the God of his fathers, the God of their fathers. What a marvelous statement to say that the God who is worshipped was my dad's God, the God of my dad. Just last night on my twins' Christian radio station, I listened to him playing in the final half hour hymns two hymns that were the ones that were my dad's favorites. I knew why Bob did it. I can still think of dad in the upper balcony of Manahawkin Baptist Church in a hot summer August day with his bass voice, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Two hymns that whenever I hear I pause because that legacy was left behind when I was a small boy. In fact, in my office at home, I've mentioned before a black and white picture of me behind a makeshift pulpit my dad built. It's like I pretend I was Billy Graham. We've tried to find amidst all my dad's stuff, that pulpit, I guess it's gone. I'd love to find, but the picture is there, that legacy. Being a man of God, fathers avoiding idolatry, having no other gods, no other things, no other persons, no other objective, no other goal, no other priority before the Lord. Father is walking before the Lord in truth, in righteousness, uprightness, integrity of heart, in the Lord's ways, keeping, obeying his statutes and commandments. Father is devoted to and following the Lord fully. 
completely. Absolutely. Fathers doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And one father who asked for Jesus' help to overcome unbelief, disbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'm not content with the faith I have. I have enough faith to come to you, but I need it to grow. Jesus, grow my faith. A positive spiritual legacy. Presentation's off the air, Jim, it says here. I'm trying it. You may have to pick up and go on. Next slide, then. Like father, like son. I recall a commercial in my youth the father washing his car with a hose and a boy with a squirt gun. Perhaps you remember that commercial. The father picks up a pack of cigarettes and it says, like father, like son. Knowing that the patterns, the habits, the customs, the priorities, the actions of a dad are mimicked, watched by his offspring. There were offspring then and now who either imitated what their fathers did or did not do, for better or for worse, and offspring who abandoned what their fathers did or did not do, for better or for worse. For those whose fathers were ungodly, good. They abandoned what they did. For those whose fathers were godly, sad that they abandoned what their fathers had done. Like father, like son, unlike father, What's the spiritual impact of we as fathers upon our children? May I give you a very frightening observation. In Exodus, twice, in Numbers once, in Deuteronomy once, as a general principle, the consequences of paternal sin can encompass three to four successive generations of offspring. That's the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. I read, the Lord is slow to anger. He's abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, but will by no means clear the guilty or leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. As a general principle that is carried forward. Families of preachers, the Wesleys, families of those who were kleptomaniacs, thieves, grandfather, father, son, grandson, the mafia, families. So the spiritual impact of fathers understand that unaddressed by conversion or transformation spiritually, what we do generally carries on to three or four successive generations. It's a sobering thought. On the one hand, for a legacy that's godly, what a foundation. On the other hand, for the ungodly, what a tragic legacy. I remind you that from four other passages of Scripture, Deuteronomy and Kings and Chronicles and Ezekiel, conversion, spiritual transformation breaks that punitive pattern. It can and is broken. I read from Ezekiel, The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. That spiritual commitment breaks the pattern, which is why it's so crucial to win our kids to Christ when they're young, as best we can. How many of you had your first training and solid grounding in Scripture when you were a child? If you had that privilege, raise your hand. We're blessed. If you did not have that privilege, you understand that part of your life you wish you could undo because that training, that guidance was not there. But we're glad you're here. 
We're glad that in God's timing he brought you to himself or that you're looking at that seriously. Otherwise, you would not be here this morning. So the spiritual impact of fathers, let's move on to my fellow dads, our role as fathers. What are we asked to do? First of all, dads, we are to spiritually lead and instruct our children and family. We are. Make sure your daughter finds the right thing. Thank you. <laughs> I recall my first male Sunday school teacher, Richard Noroth, electrician with calloused hands and dirt under the fingernails, who's now a pastor. His commitment to Christ, although he'd had wonderful women, Mrs. Lammy, for example, Althea Fredrickson, who taught us choruses we still sing, but that man with the icing on the cake, he was cool, he wasn't wimpy, he was tough, he knew Christ not just as Savior but as Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, God through St. Paul says to fathers regarding our children, bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Joseph, Joseph, sorry, Joshua, who was Moses' successor, challenged his people with this statement, quote, if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, well, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The burden for spiritual instruction and training rests not upon the shoulders of our wives, not upon our children's mother. Ideally, gentlemen, fathers, it rests upon ourselves, the husbands to our wives and the fathers of our kids. We dare not shirk that role. In Joshua 4, verses 20 through 24, going back to this man of God, 12 stones were taken from the Jordan River, and Joshua set them up at Gilgal, and he said, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, what are these stones? Inform your children, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. The Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord your God had done at the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may reverence the Lord God forever. When your children ask their fathers... Inform your children. Our children ought to know from our lives, dads, that the first spiritual questions, the first biblically text questions, should be posed to us. If they go to mom first, is it because we're not walking with the Lord or we haven't done our homework? Moms are great. Dads do not shirk the role that is ours. In Judges chapter 6, verse 13, a time when everyone did what was right in his or her own eyes, Gideon said, quote, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are his miracles which our fathers told us about? In Psalm 44, verse 1, O oh God, we've heard with our ears our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days. Our fathers have told us. In Psalm 78, verses 2 through 7, I'll utter sayings of old. 
which we've heard and known our fathers have told us. We will tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, his strength, his wondrous works that he's done. He established a testimony which he commanded our fathers that they should teach to their children, that the generation to come might know, even children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. To put confidence in God, forget not his works, and keep his commandments. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 38, verse 19, a, a father tells his sons about the Lord's faithfulness. By way of review then, number one, dads, we are spiritually to lead and instruct our children and family. Second, Dads were to encourage and to exhort our children. In contrast to the oft-repeated phrase that's the fear of every young person at home, wait altogether. Wait until your father gets home. Mm. Right. In contrast to exhort and encourage our kids from Genesis Fathers on their dying bed would bless their children. St. Peter writes this of God, the eternal father, with regard to his eternal son, Christ Jesus, quote, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made by him, made to him by the majestic glory, quote, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. In the love and compassion for us, we have to be the encouragers and the exhorters of our kids. The Apostle Paul described his own ministry in this way in his letter to the church at Thessalonica. Quote, you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. St. Paul used as his boilerplate for ministry how a father ought to encourage, exhort, and implore his kids. And so, dads, we are to exhort and encourage our children. Third, Dads, we are to discipline our children. Our colleague in ministry, Brother Neil Laborn at Barry Evangelical Free Church, had a father say to him, well, Neil, I'm just trying to be my son's friend. And Neil said, your son has lots of friends. He needs a dad. Who can say that horrible two-letter word? No. That's the first word I believe my dad told me. It's probably the first word I said back to him. No. no. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Fathers, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. Now, King David had a failure. Well, had several failures in his life. One with regard to his son, Adonijah. Did you know he had a son named Adonijah? Did you know that? No, I didn't, Rev. David failed to hold his son Adonijah accountable. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6, quote, of David, his father, Adonijah's father, never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? Why did you do this? David never did that. We're to discipline our children. From three verses in the book of Proverbs, whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. A wise son accepts his father's discipline. A scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A fool rejects his father's discipline. One he regards reproof as prudent. From the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, God deals with us as with sons, and what son is there whom his father does not discipline? 
We had earthly fathers to discipline us. We respected them. How much, much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? And so we are to discipline dads, our children. Fourth, we're to be compassionate toward and love our kids. Kish, the father of Saul, who became first king, King Saul, had anxiety for his son's well-being more than concern for the father's stuff. Perhaps his flock had been taken. He was more concerned how his son's well-being was rather than the flocks that he had. And with regard to God, the Heavenly Father, John's Gospel proclaims, Father, you've loved me before the foundation of the world. The Father loves the Son has given all things to his hand. The Father loves me because I laid down my life to take it up again. My Father has loved me. I love you. Abide in my love, says Christ. St. Paul adds, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and all comfort. Jesus observed, if, if you had to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father who is in heaven. Love, compassion, concern. As the psalmist says, as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who reverence him. John the baptizer had a role preparing the way for Jesus, and we're told he was commissioned, quote, to turn the hearts of fathers back to the children. also echoed in Malachi chapter 4. Dads, we are to be compassionate and love our kids. Next to last, dads, we're not to provoke our children to anger. And Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he has this warning, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. Bring them up into discipline and instruction of the Lord. We can make our kids mad unnecessarily. We can provoke them. We can edge them on, egg them on. That's wrong. If your child is angry, dads, we ought to ask, did I do that to you? What did I say or do that was inappropriate or wrong? I'm sorry. I apologize. I recall as a seminary student just graduated from Trinity, a situation with my dad where for the first time in my 20-some years of life, dad said, I'm sorry. Did my estimation of my dad go down that night? Oh, no. It went way up. I was angry. He disarmed my anger, recognizing what he'd done. And I think of that day with great, great joy and thanking. In terms of our roles, lastly, we're not to exasperate our children. Colossians 3, 21, fathers, don't exasperate your children so they won't lose heart. Is what your son or daughter does good enough? Clean your room. You forgot to move those shoes. Yep. Good job, son. Let me help you finish the task. I don't know what you want, Dad. Let me be more clear. Let me help you. Dad, thanks. If we don't, they become exasperated. And so in summary, earthly fathers, we're to be reflections of the heavenly Father understanding that our children's first understanding and concept of God as Heavenly Father is conditioned by their experience of us as their earthly father. Do you understand that? Yep. It's true. And so, to wind this down, lastly, what about God as Heavenly Father? He is the ultimate, the consummate Father, who's our Father in one of three ways, by creation, by our spiritual adoption as his sons and daughters, our salvation, or by our profession and confession of him, I'm a child of God. The Bible says every good thing bestowed, every perfect gift is from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variation, no shifting shadow, 
where God says, I'll be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. See what great love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And John writes in his first letter, such we are. The Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus gave himself for our sins. Paul writes to the great Galatian church, according to the will of God, the Father that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus who said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to heaven, uh-huh, to the Father, except through me. And through him, we have access in one spirit to that Father. In John's gospel, here's the will of my Father, that everyone who believes in the Son will have eternal life. My Father's house has many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I'll love him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter writes, according to his great mercy, caused us to be born again. That he's loved us, our fellowships with him and his son. And lastly, Paul writes, give thanks to the Father. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That same Father is the author of the gospel, which I remind you is this in 25 words of Jesus Christ. God's eternal Son died in your place to pay the penalty for your sin. And by trusting him, you have salvation and life eternal. What a father. What a father we can be by his grace. Father, take this portion of your word and apply it to our lives as you see fit. Amen.
God, place your hand of blessing upon this marvelous body of believers. Take each of us from this place as ambassadors for your son. And as much as he's called your son and we're adopted sons, thank you that we're family. And that your son's not afraid to call us his brothers and sisters. Bless the dads on this their day. Thank you for all that they do for us. We pray this in thanks for them and in honor of you. Amen. God bless.